Good morning. morning. Welcome to our service of worship. It's wonderful to see you and we give you an especially warm welcome as we join together and look to God for his presence, for his strength and ultimately his blessing as we look to worship him together. I'm going to begin with the intimations just to remind elders and everyone more generally that next Sunday will be one of our quarterly communion services. The Guild, this week's speaker, is Paul Rhodes of the Barnabas Fund. Our Bible study will be continuing this Tuesday in the Hub at 7 p.m. And this week we're going to look at the different genres within the Bible and how we interpret them in light of that. Holiday Club, we're still looking to get a head start on organizing. Uh, a very big thank you to those volunteers that have come forward to help with that. That's great. Uh, if you're interested in helping out at all in any of the roles, please get in touch with myself. My details are on the welcome sheet that you have got when you came in, or also Aileen Robb, her details are there too. It's running from the 27th to the 31st of July this year. Advance notice of the Guild Coffee Morning. They're holding a coffee morning and craft sale in the church hall on Saturday the 14th of March from 10 a.m. till 12 noon. There will be a stall with Easter and Mother's Day craft items for sale as well as a home baking stall. Donations of home baking will be gratefully received. Tickets are priced at £3 for adults, children are free, and they're on sale from the Hub and also from Guild members. All proceeds will go towards church funds. And finally, just to make you aware that uh, the annual World Day of Prayer service will take place on Friday the 6th of March, that's this Friday, at the Church of the Nazarene at 1.30pm, and you're all warmly invited to that service. I'm going to begin our worship by reading a few verses from the Psalms as we think about God and his covenant love this morning. Psalm 105. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. And now we come together to sing in the presence of this wonderful and mighty God in mission praise number 50, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. As we further worship God together, we unite our hearts together in prayer, but we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us all join our hearts together and pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift of being still. 
we thank you that there are times where you call us to be still amidst the noise and the chaos of our world. We thank you that the very act of gathering in a sanctuary, in a place of worship, reminds us that there is safety in God, that there is something unique and blessed and powerful to be gained from being still in the presence of an awesome and a holy God. As we look up to him and we gaze at his perfection, at his beauty, at the fact that there is no sin in him, that he doesn't make mistakes, that he isn't confused and bewildered by life. And that is why we look to you as our rock and our strength, because you're so very different to us. God, as we linger and as we're still, we realize that we actually, in and of ourselves, aren't worthy to come into your presence. That ever since Adam made that fatal mistake in the garden, that we are living in the wake of his separation from God, losing that amazing presence and connection with God, which was meant to be everlasting. And so we come as people who have known that broken and have seen the effects of it in, in every part of our own lives and hearts and see the effects of it every day. Would you have mercy upon us, O oh God, for our weakness, our need, and the fact that not only are we like this by nature, but almost daily we choose to often create a greater distance between us and you. We turn away. We, uh, we believe the lie that the serpent told Eve that God hasn't really got our good in mind, that uh, we can actually do things our own way and improve our lives. And God, we thank you for the gift of the church, for the beauty of coming week by week to realize that there is actually truth to combat the lies of the enemy. That there is actually truth in God's everlasting, his faithful, his covenant promises and love. And actually that we can be free from the exhaustion of every other part of our lives of striving and trying to make things better and working against the tide and toiling. And we can come and hear the call to faith and realize that while faith might be all we have some days, that faith is actually all we need because you've sent us a savior who we can have faith in. Because you've sent us Jesus who has shown us the way back to God. Who has come as the perfect representation and imprint and image of God. So that we might know who God is and what his heart is towards us. That he longs to gather his children in. Back into the safety and security of his care. Of his ever, everlasting, never ending love. And so God, would you help us today? Whatever our faith is found whether it is a little and it's barely hanging on, whether it is singing from the rooftops, or whether maybe we haven't begun that journey of faith today, would you speak to us about through Jesus and through his word to draw us into that family relationship with the living and the true God? And would you hear us as we call upon you in the words you taught your disciples, our Father, which art in heaven. Oh, if we've got any children with us, I'd like to invite them down to the front while I speak to them for just a wee while before they head through to junior church. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Good, good. I've got a bag here with me and I've got some things in it. Now, I'm going to show you some things. And you need to see if you can tell me how these things are related, okay? Tell me what they all have in common. Okay, so, firstly, I have my driving license, okay? Then I have 
Does anybody know what this is? Yes? Not so much? Finley, what is it? Yes, it's the burning bush, but that's not in any way what I'm trying to get at today. Um, it's my certificate to show that I'm a registered minister in the Church of Scotland. So if any of you doubted that I'm allowed to be here, there you go. Now you can see, you see you've seen the proof. It's my certificate. So I've got a driving license, my certificate that I'm allowed to be a minister. And also, does anyone know what this is? Okay, except Finlay. Does anyone else know what this is? Yes, a Taekwondo belt. So this is Finley's Taekwondo belt, and it's an orange one with a white stripe, which means that's the grade that Finley's got to just now, and he's trying to get to the next one. So, Taekwondo belt, my certificate, and my driving license. Anyone guess what's the same about all these things? What do they do? Is one of the older children? <laughs> what was that? It's got, they've got my name on them. That one does, that one does, that one doesn't. So two out of three. What do they all do? Yeah, do you want to go? Yes, well done. Say that a bit louder for everyone. They all show that you can do it. So this shows that Finley knows a few basic moves in Taekwondo. This shows that I'm allowed to drive a car if anybody ever stops and asks. And this shows that I'm allowed to be a minister. You're right. And we all had to do things to get them. Finley had to go to Taekwondo for weeks and weeks and hours and sometimes practice at home to get this belt. I had to train for about four and a half years to get this certificate. And I had to learn to drive and spend loads of money on driving lessons to do this. Now, what do we have to do to be friends with God? Does anybody know? Finley? Pray to him, yeah? Yes, Paul? <laughs> scripture. Yes, we need to read the scriptures. And all these things tell us that we need to have faith. Today with the grown-ups, we're going to be thinking about faith. Do you know how faith with God is different? It just means that we believe what God says, and then we live in light of that. So we don't have to go through hours of getting certificates and training to be a Christian. God just invites us and says, believe in me. Believe my word is true and what I'm saying about you, that I love you. And that's how you, you don't have to do all those things. It's totally different to everything else in our lives. So let's say a little prayer about that this morning. God, we thank you that you have given us the gift of faith and that you call us to our faith in you. And that even the littlest child to the oldest adult is able to do that by believing your word and then acting on it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together the hymn Mission Praise number 988, How Deep the Father's Love, before you head out to Junior Church. Thank you, boys and girls.
continuing with our covenant series today. We're going to look at the next biblical covenant, which comes in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, there's two chapters before it where God says what he's going to do. He's going to give Abraham land and children and the blessing of his presence. But Genesis 17, it takes on uh, a bit more detail as we see what the sign of that covenant and what the mark of it's going to be. So we're going to have Genesis 17 from the Old Testament and then Romans 9 from the New Testament as Paul looks back and sheds light on the significance of that covenant for our Christians today. This passage is entitled The Covenant of Circumcision. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, and you, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household, are bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household are brought with money, they must be circumcised. My covenant is new in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her to show that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah, Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful, and he will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, with whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household are brought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them, as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that very day. And every male in Abraham's house, household, including those born in his household, are brought from a for foreigner was circumcised with him. Oh 
Our second reading today is from the the New Testament, Romans 9, reading verses 1 to 14. Excuse me. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart. For I wish, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of son- to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human hands- ancestry of the Messiah, who is God all over, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offsprings will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and action might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Amen. Before we come to God's word, we'll sing together one more time in Mission Praise number 932, Standing on the Promises.
There were many different interpretations and reasons given for what the Brexit vote was all about recently. Uh, I'm not going to do politics in the pulpit today, it's just an illustration, so you can rest assured you're not going to get any sermons on Brexit, which we shouldn't be doing anyway. But there were various explanations offered. I've read at least four or five different articles, essays on uh, things ranging from what was about uh, some people wanting deregulation so they could make more money or it was about paid projects of politicians or it was about uh, restoring our democracy and our liberty or it was about racism and narrow-mindedness and well, it couldn't be about all those things maybe it could be about a bit of all of them but there was so much debate over what was the real center of it what was it really all about and I'm not going to in any way proffer an explanation or an opinion on that what I am going to liken it to is what we often find in Christianity. I wonder if someone asked you, what's Christianity all about? I bet we would get a lot of different responses in this room, in any church, in any room. I bet we would, it would somehow express, in many ways, what it's been for us and, and, and what it's meant to us. And there's probably no, it would probably be unkind to say there's one sentence that you could respond to that that would be just the right one. Of course, Christianity is complex and it is many things. But what I do want to argue, and I hope we'll see together through the text this morning, that as we study the covenant made with Abraham, I hope that we'll see that something you could answer that would definitely be true would be that Christianity is at its core about faith and about faith in God. And quite often, we assume that we know that because we think, well, of course, you know, you need to have faith in God. You need to have faith in Jesus to be saved. And that's the short and the quick explanation. But I think your faith gets a lot deeper and a lot more real when you see that it didn't just start at the time of Jesus, that faith in God actually runs as a thread all the way back to the time of Abraham. We're doing the covenants and you'll be well versed in now by the fact that covenants are like a spine that runs all the way through the Bible, which is why I have that graphic up there. Because I've said that if you get the covenants and you have at least a, a cursory understanding of them all, you will know the kind of narrative of the Bible of what God's doing with people in history. But also, a bit like your ner central nervous system runs through your spine and almost everything else is controlled by it, so if you get the covenants, just about every other area of Christian life and belief kind of branches off from it. So what we know about being saved and having salvation, what we know about being the church and gathered as God's people, they, they all kind of hang on this, the spine of the covenants. So we've considered creation, that God entered into a bond, because that's one of the marks of a covenant, a, a bond between God and man. And God entered into that with Adam. And then God in a covenant, we've learned, sets the terms. And Adam wasn't able to keep the terms. And we've all been in a bit of a mess ever since. And then the other thing is that a lot of them have is a physical marker or a sign. It was, we had the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then we had the rainbow and Noah. And ever since Adam the question that we should be asking with the Bible is going, how is this going to resolve? The scriptures in many ways become a drama 
Like any great story, we would sit down and watch and get some popcorn for, only this is the life and death, the stakes of uh, God and eternity. And man, how is this going to play out? If Adam pulled us all out of that uh, relationship with God and we're now sinners and we're lost and separated from God and from his promises, we're asking, how is this going to be resolved? Is God's original plan of having people who will worship him and be close to him and will live with him for eternity and the earth will be beautified by their glorifying God, will that work out? And then we saw in the Noah one, things just went from bad to worse. There was a downward spiral, and we're left saying, it doesn't look like there's much hope at this point, except God seems to start a whole new economy of grace and giving people something they don't deserve. It's like God's getting to, deciding to get involved in a new way, which is why he shows grace to Noah and he, he stabilizes the creation. He gives this promise that says, I'm going to set the stage. I am going to make things regular in terms of the seasons. I'm never again going to wipe things out with a flood. So we now have a hint at, okay, because God has made those promises, maybe now something can happen. Maybe somebody can come and write this mess in terms of people being separated from God. And now we come to Abraham. And we start to get another hint at this covenant of how God's going to bring all this about. What he's going to do to help us out of our predicament. Abraham is the first one where we really learn about faith. And that God gives us this gift of faith that goes some way to correcting this whole mess that we find ourselves in. So what I want to do is I want to consider, as I've done in other weeks, the position of God as the person who makes the covenants in this passage and the position of the person who's receiving it, Abraham in this one, God then Abraham, and then I want to look at the sign because the sign unlocks so much for us in this covenant. Firstly, God, how does the, let's say the character of God emerge onto the scene in this covenant? What does he do? What role does he fulfill? Well, we read that he declares himself in verse 1, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. You might have heard the Hebrew term El Shaddai. That's where we get this from. And it means that God is completely in sovereign control over absolutely everything he is. And so often, good understanding of the Bible and of and of faith starts with this. It, it doesn't actually start with us and our faith. It starts with the God who has spoken and who's shown up and shown us what he's like. And, so, and it starts with acknowledging that God is this sovereign, powerful deity. It starts there. And he shows up and he says, I am that God. And by implication, anything I say is right and good and true. And also, I'm completely trustworthy because I'm fully in control of what's going on in your situation. And then he calls Abraham into relationship with him. And the other thing that God does that's so interesting in this narrative is that he changes his name. In verse 3, you'll read that he's not to be called Abraham anymore, but you will be Abraham. It just adds one little sound in the Hebrew, but it's very important. He changes his name to something like exalted father. Now, Listen to where we were in the story. Abraham's 99, and he doesn't have any kids. And God is changing his name to Exalted Father. Why does he change his name? Well, in the culture Abraham lives in, it's a really big deal getting your name changed. We know something of this. Um, quite often when we have children, we choose names that are significant. Maybe a name of a relative, because it means something. It's reminiscent of someone we loved. Or, or maybe it... It's a name that the actual meaning of the name's dear to us. Um, I remember when our firstborn, when we were choosing his name, Finley, uh, it's a Gaelic name, and in the Gaelic it means something like fair warrior. Uh, he was really blonde at first, and then he kind of went darker, and we thought, okay, well, we didn't get that one right. But we, <laughs> we liked the warrior part, and we hoped that would turn out to be true. We hoped that he would be strong, and, you know, as we hope for all our kids, that um, they'll grow to be strong and courageous and those are good things that you hope for. So we, we really liked that name. But that was us choosing it. And we hoped it would have something. But in the Hebrew world, it was your identity. Name was quite often uh, not just your identity, but a marker of your destiny, of how things would turn out for you. Name was power in the ancient world. 
For instance, you could put spells or curses on someone if you had their name. Um, or you could in some way determine what, how things are going to turn, turn out for them for the better and for the positive. In, in the Hebrew tradition, it was like a prophecy over their life that, that things would go a certain way for them. And God with his power is coming to Abraham and saying, I am determining your destiny. You might not have any kids right now. But I am declaring by changing your name, you are going to be an exalted father. You are going to sit at the head of a tribe of many, many, many people. And God is in a way declaring, I don't care how ridiculous that sounds because what is my name? I'm El Shaddai. I am the powerful and almighty God. And if I declare this, this can happen. He changes his name and he gives him that power. But do you know what I love about the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament scriptures is it's so unique for the ancient world. God doesn't just do that as some uh, mon divine monster in the sky who, because of his power, decides to throw his weight around. It's the promises of love that go with it. See what he says, walk before me in verse 1 faithfully and be blameless. That walk before me means walk in my sight, walk under my careful oversight and my loving, watchful eye. You, Abraham, are being called into relationship with me. And then he promises as well that I'll make you a father of many nations. I'll make you fruitful. I'll establish my covenant for you. I will be your God and your descendants will be my people. It's personal, familial possession. It's unheard of in the ancient world that people make covenants between each other and they, they invoke God as the witness to this deal they're making but a God actually coming and bonding himself to people to individual specific people that didn't happen and God is shattering all that and saying I'm going to bond myself to you I'm not just using my power for my own glory. I'm also using it to show my love to you and to your descendants and to be faithful to you. So there's the bond that we always get in a covenant. God shows up and gives it. And what, what does Abraham do? What's his, his reaction to this? Look at his first reaction in verse 3. After God says that, I'll greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell, verse 3, face down. And he doesn't say anything else. And then God says to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. So if you examine that, Abram hears this. And it's almost more than he can take. For whatever reason, he can't bear it. And he falls face down and he doesn't open his lips. He doesn't say another word. And God comes in. It's kind of like a one-two. God comes in with his next big block of promises. I'm going to make this covenant with you. And, and, and Abraham is dumbstruck because this great almighty God has chosen to show up and, and, and called Abraham into relationship with him, has chosen to give him the one thing he lacks. In the ancient world, it was a big deal not to have kids. It wasn't just a luxury. It was, it was what in some sense made you of any worth in the community was can, can you... Can you continue your family line? Can you produce another generation? And he doesn't have any. And here's this God. And let's just get into what that must have been like for Abraham. He doesn't have it. It's obviously what he wants more than anything in the world. It's what's normal in the culture and what shows that you are something. In many ways, it's what shows God favors you. And it's almost like he's falling face down because he can't cope because... It's, he's thinking, let it be so, because if this isn't true and, and God is in any way messing with me, this is going to be a disaster. He falls face down in verse 3. And then his next reaction is in verse 17. Abram fell face down again after this dialogue with God. And he laughed to himself. And he asks, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? So this time he falls face down and he laughs. Why does he laugh? I don't know. I've got a few good guesses. Maybe he laughs because he thinks it's funny, but I'm not convinced by that because Abram is in a position of complete reverence. He's completely in awe of this great God and what he's promising him. I, I, I happen to think it's probably more a laugh of incredulity. He just can't believe that this could possibly be the case. And you know that way sometimes when you're, you're at the edge of, of despair and we often say, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. 
you, you've kind of done all your tears and you've exhausted yourself in your anguish. I think Abraham's more there and he doesn't know what else to do but laugh. And it's so beautiful because then Isaac's name, the son of promise, becomes, you could translate it as laughter, Yitchak, or the one who God laughs or smiles upon. It's got that whole idea. And I like to think that for the inside circle, Abraham and Sarah and other people that knew them, they would know Isaac was called that because Abraham laughed, as does Sarah. But then for the wider uh, reputation, it would be, he's called that because God has smiled on us. He's shown us his favor, even though we didn't deserve it. And he's called us into a relationship of faith. So Abraham goes through something of a process. And then look at the way he responds. He's in this engagement with God. He's wrestling with God in a way. And then verse 23, on that very day, after hearing all God's promises, and after actually he gives God a few uh, rebuttals, and, and he says, well, maybe it could be Ishmael. He kind of tries to take control of it and tries to think of a more natural explanation for how this promise could work out. And, and God says, gently and lovingly, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. My supernatural, miraculous promise, that's how the covenant will be fulfilled. And so then Abraham does nothing but respond. On verse 23, on that very day, Abram took a son, Ishmael, and all those born in his household were bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told them. And so after this wrestling, Abraham finally responds in faith. What is faith? It's what, like grace. It's one of these ones we throw around and we say all the time. Well, I'd like to suggest to you, given that we're in the Old Testament and Abraham has some faith, because the New Testament writer said he did. What it seems to be is God's come with covenant promises and terms. And Abraham has wrestled with that a bit. But what he's done now is he's taken God at that word. He has believed that God will give him descendants. And then he's acted upon it. And, and, and faith is actually incredibly simple. It is Believing that what God has said, he has said is true. And then living our lives as though we believe that. In light of that belief. In light of the fact that we've taken God at his word. And it's done something within us. And, and sometimes that will be mixed with great emotions. And we'll feel very faithful and very strong and exuberant. And other times we will feel as though... Well, we won't feel like doing very much of it. We won't feel like doing maybe the prayer and the reading and the worship and... And stuff. But the faith isn't actually dependent on that. The faith is that we're continuing to take God at his word, to believe that what he has spoken is true, that all that he has promised will come to pass, and acting according to that. That's God, that's Abraham. What about the covenant? What about the, the sign in this passage, in this covenant with Abraham? Well, he circumcises them as God told them. And Abraham himself was 99 when he was circumcised. Circumcision, we are a long way from the world of the Bible and it seems pretty strange to us. Um, obviously still practiced by practicing Jews. It's not so strange for them, so it's not unheard of in the modern, modern world. It wasn't unheard of to Abraham either. It wasn't a new thing. Um, other cultures in the ancient Near East around uh, Abraham and his family would have practiced this, particularly the Egyptians. And it's so interesting to compare how it was practiced in that world compared to what God does with it. So in that ancient world, quite often uh, young men would be circumcised around the age of puberty and entering into manhood. And it was actually, we know from historical records, a sign of, uh, to, co to coincide as being a sign of fertility or virility. It was a sign of the strength and the power to continue one's descendants in line. And that's kind of what it represented. And... I was amazed this way because I was studying this and I saw the difference of what God does with circumcision. Because he says, do it to all the boys when they're eight days old. What's Abraham's big wrestle and struggle with God? I don't have any kids and I don't have the power to give myself any kids. I'm completely and utterly dependent on God to make this happen and, and to make his promises come through. And rather than 
continue that practice of it's a sign of power, man's power and fertility. Rather, in taking helpless babies, God makes it a sign of, it's a sign of utter weakness. It's a sign of utter dependence upon the living and the true God to fulfill his promises, to make anything happen, to even give us the blessing of children and family. It's that it's out of our hands. It becomes a sign of the fact that because we're on a journey and things have been made a mess of at creation, some blood is going to have to be spilled in order that this might work out, that God and humans will be reconciled. It's a very early sign of that. But most importantly, it's a sign of complete dependence on God. And you know, friends, this is actually, in the Old Testament, one of the main reasons that I'm convinced that we ought to do infant baptisms in the church. This is certainly part of my conviction, is that it's a beautiful picture of bringing a young and a tender life. And, and Abraham is the father of the faithful. He, he does this for his kids in faith. And so a child, uh, a parent who loves the Lord and believes in God by faith, comes and does a similar thing and presents the child and says, I want them to be brought into the promises of the family of God. I want them to experience the presence of God and friendship with him and fellowship with him. And that's why I'm presenting them. I'm doing this as a response and an act of faith. And that's why we do that. And it's a wonderful picture of the fact that you nor I nor anyone else, we can't save ourselves. God has promised to save people who call on him in faith. And that's got nothing to do with them or their ethnicity or their background or where they come from. And everything to do with the faithfulness of God to respond in love and mercy and grace to those who call upon his name. And so God is the one who comes in his power and changes a, fa a man's destiny and his family. He's going to give him a, a, a natural family, but also a spiritual family. Did you see that I'll be with your descendants forever? We're already starting to see a hint in this covenant that God is going to do something eternal through this family. And Abraham responds as a struggling and a weak and a wrestling man, but a man who responds in faith. And then the sign is given to show that it's actually all about faith rather than strength or power or anything else. So what do we do with that, with the people in this covenant and, and the nature of this covenant of faith? What, where does that leave you and me? When I was reading this this week, I thought, do you know what a good response to this passage and this covenant might be? If, if you have faith and you've come and tasted of God's grace in your heart and he's changed your life and you know his presence, I wanted to challenge you. When was the last time you bowed your face like Abraham, just in awe and wonder that God did that for you? That he chose you, that he loved you. He didn't have to, but he has. We're entering a season just now of um, some Christians practice Lent, and it, it's from a similar point of view of, I, I want to take seriously what God has actually done in history and the journey to the cross, and so I don't mind either bowing physically or even bowing in my heart by giving something up but it's not in any way to earn God's favor it's it's to show nothing but gratitude for the love that he's poured out on me and then secondly if you're here today and you haven't tasted of this and you're not sure if you're a Christian or if you're included in God's promises well you know there was a day where Abraham wasn't we call him the father of the faithful and he started faith but Abraham's a man on a journey. He doesn't have this all worked out at this point. In fact, he gets a call. God says, walk before me faithfully. We live in a, especially these days, in an increasingly frightening world and we don't have security and maybe our worries aren't, oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids or maybe they are, maybe they have been at some point, but we all have uncertainty. And God comes to that. And maybe God comes and speaks to you today and says, walk before me. Why don't you come and enjoy the blessing of starting a journey with me and walking and knowing that you have the presence and the love of God as your guiding light? Because that invitation is open and goes out to all. And then thirdly and finally, I think an implication for us could be to do with the area of struggling with faith. Of the fact that in Abraham, we have these stories because they show us the fact that it's not always easy. 
the call to even just accept God's promises can be really difficult. For the Christians in the New Testament, God has promised that he will work everything together for our good and for the glory of God. And there can be many days and seasons in our lives where it doesn't feel or look as though that is happening at all. And we can't possibly imagine how God could be working our current circumstances out for our good. And we can't possibly imagine how God even some days could be in control of it when we're experiencing what we are. And I think God's word would come to us today and comfort us and encourage us. God actually doesn't ask a lot for you. He asks you to believe that he's given you the gift and the ability to have faith. And some days that'll feel easier than others. But also walk before him. Put one foot in front of the other. Very often that's all that you're called to do. And, and leave the rest to him. In some ways that can be the hardest part about faith. But my dear friends, the, the reality is we can control so little in our lives anyway. There is so, so much when we strip it all back that is way beyond our control. And so maybe God is working in you and on you to wrestle with you a little bit and to get you to the point where maybe you stop bargaining. Maybe you stop going, if only I could change and control this in my power. Maybe God is asking you to let go of that and surrender that so that you can see what he might do and how he might work it out for his glory and for your good. The covenant of Abraham is all about faith and it shows us that the Christian life is all about faith. Not perfect faith, not unwavering faith, but faith nonetheless because it's guaranteed and backed up by the El Shaddai, the all-powerful God who comes to humans and in their weakness says, I will be enough. I will be your God. You will be my people. We will be an everlasting fellowship and nobody's going to be able to take that away. Not your feelings, not your uh, changing circumstances from day to day. Nothing can break God's covenant promises. May he bless his word to us this morning. We're going to respond, we're going to take up our offerings as we remain seated and uh, offer our praises to God in the hymn Mission Praise number 645, the God of Abraham Praise, and we'll lift up this offering of singing and also uplift our offerings at this time.
please be upstanding. seated. We again draw near to God and look to dedicate our offerings, but also offer up our prayers and our intercessions for others. Let's once again join our hearts together and pray. God of grace, we are reminded week after week of the outstanding and the incomprehensible nature of your goodness to us. In many ways, we are bowed low with our face to the ground, asking why has God been so good to us? And so we ask you would take our offerings as a token of our thankfulness, of our gratitude, that they would rise up to heaven and be a pleasing sacrifice to you, and then in turn be put to use and blessed so that other people may hear of this incredible and amazing grace of God that changes lives and hearts and returns people to God that they might worship him once again, that they might uh, be able to offer expressions of love themselves to him because of what he has done for them. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his faithfulness in coming to fulfill all the promises and all the foreshadowing and all the hope that we find in the Old Testament. We thank you that it's come to be the perfect sacrifice, our perfect fulfillment and replacement, and the one uh, under whose blood that we all stand, so that we are able to come and approach you and call you Father. God, we pray for those who, on our own families who may be on our mind today. We are all burdened with different situations, different struggles that are our experience of life. Whether close or extended family, we all come and experience difficulty and we bring it to you, O God, and ask that as we bring our burdens to you, that you may hear them, that you may acknowledge them, and that you may give us faith to see you working in even the most difficult circumstances. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless those of our number who are known to us, who are laid aside this week in hospital, in care homes, in other institutions, those who are laid aside at home and unable to gather with us. We ask that you would bless them and that they would know that nearness and presence of God that Abraham himself experienced, that they and we would all know God holding us looking in our faces and communicating his undying and never-ending love. That we would know that all the more because of what it has cost our God, what it has cost the Father in sacrificing his beloved Son, what it has cost the Son in laying himself down so that we might be restored and brought back where Adam so drastically failed. God, we pray that you would apply the power and the wonder of the gospel to every one of us afresh this day and this week. Lord, we pray for our country and our world uh, in the grips of a fearful and horrible situation with a spreading virus all over the world. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless all those in governing authority at the local, national, and international level. We pray for those who steer the World Health Organization. We pray for those who steer local NHS boards all over the country, and also at the highest level for those who chair cabinet meetings in our country who are our elected officials. We pray for them, Lord, knowing that each and every one of them is a weak and flawed sinful human being such as we are. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless them and guide them, that you, by your grace and goodness, would help them to make good, the best possible decisions for the best outcomes for the safety of the most people. And we pray, oh Lord, that you would give us grace in our hearts to remember uh, that even our officials are human such as we are, 
made in the image of God gloriously, but also broken in their own ways. And so, God, we pray above all that we as a nation would look to put our hope in God alone, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that we would put our refuge not uh, in princes and not in our officials and not in any leadership other than the leadership of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of heaven who is enthroned and enrobed in majesty. And God, would you help us and give us perseverance whatever we face? Would you help us to grow in our Christian character and our love and so that the depth of our faith will not be affected by the circumstances around us, but indeed will only be driven deeper when we face adversity? Hear our prayers. Bless us, help us, and go before us. In Jesus' name we ask it for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Before we conclude our worship, we'll sing one more time, lifting up our voices together to God's praise and mission praise number 201, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all this day and forevermore.